Thank you uh, for having me here. I appreciate that. Uh, just starting off, how many of you folks out there have been to the Ash Creek uh, State Wildlife Area? Okay, a number probably 10% or less. Um, I, uh, I was uh, asked by an area Snyder uh, to, uh, to present this after posting uh, lots of photos over the years from field work on Facebook CMPS page, so be careful what you post online. Um, first off, I'd like to say that uh, this isn't my project. I've just been involved with it, uh, being retained to read the vegetation plots. And uh, the uh, project proponent actually is the, uh, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife the State who owns and operates the area. And the project itself was uh, spearheaded by the Pitt RCD under the direction and leadership of Todd Slope, who's a friend of ours. Um, and you can see various entities involved, and on the bottom is the uh, various sources of funding for the project. So if you have any more uh, questions about that kind of bigger picture, you can feel free to, uh, to follow up with me after the talk. Uh, Ash Creek State Wildlife Area is in the northeastern portion of California on the Modoc Plateau, straddling the Modoc and Lassen County lines. Uh, this is Highway 299. It's about 100 miles uh, northeast of Redding uh, on the cold high Modoc Plateau. Uh, the watershed of Ash Creek encompasses about 250 square miles. Uh, Ash Creek itself flows westward. You can see this little red area here is the wildlife area. You can see this whole watershed funnels through the floodplain of Ash Creek Wildlife Area before it hits and drains into the Pitt River, which drains south and uh, west to uh, Lake Shasta. This topographic map here kind of gives you the layout of the land. Uh, this is Highway 299 on the bottom here. The town of Aden is on the east, the town of Beaver on the southwest, and the town of Lookout on the northwest there, Pitt River flowing north to south. And you can see the heart of the wildlife area, and this is about nine and a half miles across east to west, four and a half north to south. The heart of the wildlife area is the Ash Creek floodplain, entering from the east, going through the series of meandering channels into what's historically known as Big Swamp, which isn't a swamp as we know. We don't have swamps in California. This is a marsh, a big marsh system. Um, this photograph here is from Google Earth Imagery, uh, 2012. Shows you a little bit of the vegetation the patterns, and it gives you a context of the land use. Um, this part of Modoc Plateau has a long history and legacy of agriculture. A lot of cattle grazing, livestock, mostly cattle, uh, sheep historically. Uh, these fields here are a lot of irrigated alfalfa, uh, uh, there's uh, other grains being grown here and uh, assorted other crops. But I want to emphasize that this is, uh, it has a legacy of land use. Uh, the wildlife area has been owned by the state since, uh, I believe, the mid-1980s, late-1980s. This is Big Swamp down here, the riparian quarter of Ash Creek. I'd like you to focus on these kind of brown areas here. This area here and this area here are what has been referred to as the degraded portions of the floodplain. And that's the focus of about 3,000 acres of restoration that Pitt RCD has been working on. Uh, just a couple examples of some of the habitats. It's a very rich place for those of you who haven't been there. It's a wonderful place to be in the spring and summer. Uh, wildlife resources are fantastic. This is actually one of their managed wetlands. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a burned swale along the north edge of the wildlife area. Great basin scrub with dry meadow, remnants of the riparian corridor in the background. Uh, there are vernal pools up there, and they're interesting in different settings. This one here is part of the floodplain, uh, down India dominated. That plateau in the background is uh, Western Cooper Woodland, which is the only place on the wildlife area where it's known. Here's another vernal pool, pink with Allium lamoniae, something we don't see down here in the valley. And we have green vernal pools too. Glad you bought there's that. Down India back of uh, down India B. Cornuda, down India back of Lupi. And one of the rare down Indias, this is down India Leita, Great Basin down India. Other rare species up there include Carrick Sheldonii, Astragalus Lamonii, uh, Macoon's Buttercup, Marsh Hedge Nettle are others. So it's a rich resource. Uh, it's a very important area for nesting sandhill cranes. I think it's the largest uh, breeding ground for this species in the state of California on public lands. Antelope, pronghorn antelope, important kidding ground for the winter. And here's a yellow-headed blackbird, a species of concern, sitting in the cattail marsh. So it's a regionally important area, and of course ducks. Now we can't forget this is a wildlife area that's primary uh, 
purpose and management has been for wildlife uh, since Fish and Game, or Fish and Wildlife has had it. And rich and diverse as it is, not all is well up there. Uh, I first was there in 1991 for one of my first contract surveys. This, whoops, this yellow species that we see here basically wasn't present in 1991. Uh, this is Dyer's woad, Isatis tinctoria invasive crucifer which has basically come to dominate large portions of the degraded floodplain since 1991. Big fat mule deer. This photograph just reminds us that the legacy of land use is old. Uh, there's uh, ranching activities have been there for more than 120 years, and more recently, uh, Fish and Wildlife has been managing for wildlife, creating ponds, uh, dikes, berms, uh, etc. Old artifacts sitting in the sea of Poa bulbosa and cheatgrass, and new artifacts. This is a box culvert that's been eroded out of its um, intended use. So water management, water diversions, ditching, burn ponds uh, has been integral to what is now the functioning floodplain. And of course, uh, livestock. Uh, this isn't on the wildlife area. In the recent years, uh, cattle have been pulled off. But their tendency to aggregate in these riparian corridors and these arid lands uh, definitely presents its own uh, land legacy. Lots of you most probably are familiar with the impacts of livestock on riparian uh, corridors. Uh, the top, uh, I'm a little going through and working. The top diagram basically shows a stream in equilibrium with classic sea cut banks. Cattle come in, they knock down the banks, increase the amount of erodible soil which erodes. A new uh, channel starts to be uh, incised with new vertical banks that are further degraded and punched in. And eventually what you wind up with is a, is a base flow at new equilibrium with a channel inside an oversized channel in this laid back bank and step bank morphology. But very importantly, the floodplain is high and dry. It's disconnected both from the groundwater and from seasonal overland flows. And that's the, that, that is actually the approach of this restoration project is to bring back the functioning geomorphology, hydrology of the floodplain. Uh, this is an example of the main channel of Ash Creek showing the native wetland vegetation in this little tiny strip along the lower bank, probably 10 to 12 vertical cut bank in, and the top is dominated by a mixture of mostly non-native annual mustards, grasses, and the yellow is the Isatis tinctoria. Another example, uh, this here is probably about a 14-foot vertical cut bank, native vegetation confined to this little zone, and you can see the dewatered, um, invaded, uh, floodplain above, which again is the subject of restoration. That is the remnant of riparian uh, corridor to east of the wildlife area. Uh, this is a disconnected channel. Uh, this is at one time function to convey uh, water from the main channel of Ash Creek on higher flows. Even though it has ponded water, uh, this is disconnected, probably just ponds uh, groundwater during uh, the wet season. And you can see this mix again of non native mustards, cheap grass, and Medusa head on the dewatered floodplain. Um, this is an extreme example of that phenomenon, another disconnected channel here, probably about eight feet deep. And this is all Medusa head, cheap grass, Aphora interrupta, um, uh, undesirable non-natives. And this is that large brown portion on that aerial photograph that you saw. So the technique is called pond, pond and plug. And this is the largest uh, project involving this technique that's ever been done in California, and maybe ever. Uh, over 3,000 acres have been subject, and two principal components represented by the yellow-orange, which is the plug component, and the blue part, which is the pond component. And basically the idea is, is they go in with large equipment, excavators, and they borrow soil from these pond areas, and they plug up the oversized and disconnected channels, or most of them. And they also leave a design channel which is undersized, intended to convey the floodwaters, convey base waters, but not contain it all. So water flows back onto the floodplain, is retained by the ponds, enabling water to percolate into the groundwater, retain floodwaters on the floodplain, and basically attenuate uh, the, um, the seasonal runoff. Here's another example showing the ponds and plugs and the uh, design channel. It's a heavy-handed technique, but unlike planting, this is actually changing the baseline geomorphology back to what is envisioned as a more natural uh, functioning level, and the vegetation takes care of itself. In this cross-section, you can see uh, this is a survey cross-section across the floodplain. 
The black line represents pre-construction topography. This is the main channel of Ash Creek down here, deeply incised. These are other little side channels. The blue represents a pond or a borrow area where soil will be borrowed. That soil is used to plug some of these overflow channels here, these brown spikes that you see go down. The red line over here is the post-construction uh, uh, topography. And again, some of the soil is used actually in the channel of the main Ash Creek to plug above and below the pond areas. Here's another example showing the pond. Whoops, see these? The pond, this blue area associated with one of these deeply incised channels and the various brown plugged areas. And you can envision just from this diagram here as a cross section, water coming onto this floodplain is forced to higher elevations in the soil profile. Here's an example. This is a disconnected channel that uh, hasn't conveyed floodwaters or flow for probably decades, um, according to the hydrologic mo uh, modeling. This is in September of 2012 at the onset of construction of uh, the first phase. This is that channel looking downstream. Um, here's an excavator, and what they did, they tried to uh, salvage as much of the native uh, perennial vegetation that might be associated with the banks and lower bed of whatever channels they're messing with. They pull that aside and then they bring in uh, excavated earth from the pond areas. This is one of the large ponds, it's relatively shallow. This is at our two poles site, it's called November of 2012. You can see this pond here, and this is the plug, the beginning of a plug that extends down slope. This is November of 2012 after water was turned into the design channel. Now, this was before the rains of the season, so this is actually dry season hydrology, and this is the first time this channel may have uh, conveyed such water in how many decades, it's not even known. And this is November 15th at that pond site where water has uh, been delivered and uh, is starting to be distributed across the floodplain. This is a view of the plug looking downstream, that's the old channel. You see groundwater start to wick up around the edges of it uh, and eventually it seeps into the plug uh, and hopefully um, vegetation establishes on it that is a semblance of native uh, vegetation. This is an example of the main channel of Ash Creek uh, further east. Here's a truck here for the scale. You can see this is probably about 14 feet in size. There's your native wetland vegetation. Some of it's been pulled back. Uh, there's your non-native Isatis, Tinctoria, cheatgrass, the dewatered floodplain. Note these trees for reference. Here are excavators. This is, doesn't look like a restoration project, does it? Um, these are excavators. You're bringing in the borrowed earth to plug the, the channel. There is the channel September of 2014, where the channel was, and November of 2015, before the final phase of the project was implemented and the new channel conveying water back onto the floodplain. And you can see there's a lot of annual grasses here on this plug, which has been part of, the, I think, their challenge, one of the challenges. Um, they, they want to make the plug slightly higher than the surrounding floodplain, just by inches even, so that it doesn't become a conveyance for uh, erosive forces. Um, but we'll see once the water's turned off to this meadow here, uh, what becomes of that vegetation. This is an overflow channel that they estimated has been disconnected and not conveying water for perhaps 50 years. This is uh, later on that month after water's been turned back on into the uh, design channel. And this is September of 2013 showing uh, some of the vegetative response, which in previous decades, this would have been dry and brown uh, by probably June. This overview, March 2013, shows the wildlife area. This is Ash Creek. This is the completed phase one. And you can see how water coming from the main channel of Ash Creek has now been distributed across that earlier brown portion of the floodplain. This is phase two and three, which had not been completed yet. And so you can kind of see at this level, at least this gross level, kind of a big difference in um, the basic function hydrology. This is Elkins Lane across here which was lowered, that was another part of the project. They took that down floodplain grade so it no longer bisected um, the floodplain and waters are free to move from uh, east to west. One other component, Ducks Unlimited put in a gravity-fed pipe which conveys water from the south towards these managed ponds on the terrace north of the floodplain on the north side. So here is an aerial photo showing the larger of the two, this is the phase one, a dewatered floodplain. And this is in 2012 early, and this is 2013 showing the DuPont's plug channel and an overall greening up. But note that artifact of this line here. Not all that green is green, obviously. Um, but that shows you, gives you an idea of the extent of the, of the restoration. In total, 
3,235 acres were reconnected, 25 linear miles of channel were built, 92 ponds created, almost a million cubic yards of earth moved at a cost of about three and a half million dollars. This is a pond two years after construction. Uh, there were 92 piezometer uh, groundwater monitoring stations set up in six transects and uh, 37 permanent transects for vegetation monitoring. And again, this is the only part that I've really been involved with. I did some pre-construction baseline surveys and have been reading the plots um, for PID RCD. I don't have data summarized. We're going to uh, collect data to, uh, through 2019, uh, starting in 2011. Um, so the data aren't entered, they're not analyzed, but this is one transect that shows you uh, some of the transformation that is occurring out there. Transect 125, July 2011. This is August 31st, 2014, after phase one and during phase two. You can see now evidence of, well, first off, these are all annual grasses, Apera interrupta, some poa bulbosa, cheap grass, brome, uh, Japanese brome. Um, you can already see here August 31st, some transformation occurring. And July 17, 2015, we couldn't find the transect, uh, the markers. We had to come back with uh, submeter GPS to locate the origin of terminus. Um, here's the same transect looking the other way, July 27, 2011. Note this is a reddish uh, cheatgrass zone right here. And, and um, this is August 31st, 2014. And the same view, July 17th, 2015. Um, so there are some substantial differences in some of the transects. Uh, not all of them have been this dramatic, but uh, the third phase was just finished this last fall. So we're going to have to see how things progress here over the coming years. That's one of the plots that it looks like that we're actually taking the vegetation uh, readings from. And uh, we also have biomass uh, clipping done at each of the transects. And Todd Slope was really nice and, and thoughtful in all the local school kids. Uh, they were hired from the high school to help with aspects of the, uh, of the monitoring. It was a nice place to work, a good experience for them. And uh, also, it's our old friend Lowell Ahart. Uh, he has accompanied me on all the trips up there since 2008 and has collected almost a thousand voucher specimens that you can access in the consortium of Herbaria. And it was a pleasure to work with him. And he'll be going up again with me uh, this coming summer uh, to continue with the monitoring and eventually we'll probably present data for you guys. So that's it. Um, well, we do have a few minutes for questions if there are any. It's a big heavy hand. Yeah, question. Hi. Hey, thanks for coming, John. Uh, I'm trying to imagine if, if cattle running and cattle grazing seem to be such important forces shaping vegetation patterns. What historically, what animals grazed there? I, I, I gather mule deer and some pronghorn, but how intense was that, that grazing activity? What kind of behaviors do they congregate around creeks and trample in the way cattle seem to do? Well, that's a great question. Um, elk were probably the largest ungulate herding animals there, antelope, mule deer. Reading the uh, settlers' accounts, of, like when Beckworth was in Sierra Valley, um, the numbers and uh, size of the herds were appreciable. But we have to remember, too, back then there were no fences. And uh, there was probably, I would imagine, there were probably areas that were very heavily impacted and areas that were not so impacted and differed between the years depending on the season. Um, cattle are heavier, uh, they tend to aggregate in certain areas and fencing doesn't give them the ability to uh, move beyond an area once it's been uh, utilized. So I, I, it's a great question. I wish we, we did know. I mean, obviously disturbance was part of the system, but the nature of the disturbance, obviously something different. Thanks. Huh? Any questions? Okay. I encourage you all to get up there and check the place out. Now, if you get there, Hey, John? Yeah, yeah, yes. John, yeah, yeah. What, are, what are you here? Yeah, uh, you, you didn't, did you not mention uh, why they didn't uh, reseed the area with uh, uh, Sweden natives or, or whatever would be compatible with wildlife management up there? Um, there was actually a restoration component where they did plant uh, some woody vegetation along the creek. 
but that floodplain is so dynamic with, um, and it's actually been interesting to watch since the early 1990s how the pattern changes on the floodplain year to year. There's seeds going all over the place. And if you saw that, remember that one transect uh, that I showed towards the end there, um, there was spike rush, there were several species of sedge, Senecio hydrophilus, uh, Rumex, uh, Salicifolia, all assorted uh, uh, Nephelium palustrae, Mimulus catatus, all these species are floating around that floodplain. And uh, there really isn't a, a functional need to, to bring seeds through a floodplain that's scattering seeds yearly um, around. And so I think that this is one example where you tweak the, you know, you tweak the hydrology and the basic condition and the vegetation kind of takes care of itself in terms of the herbaceous stuff. You have a question about that? Uh, are you using uh, willow, uh, willows at all anywhere to help hold on to the soil? Um, not to hold on to the soil, no. No, there was, I think there was some uh, planting of uh, some hawthorn, Willows and Oregon ash, basically for wildlife the habitat cover and use. Um, but it's it's generally a low gradient system, and I think once the vegetation is established, the herbaceous stuff, it'll probably uh, take care of the erosion. But that's something that uh, that remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.